focus on is the summation of the message of the Quran. And we've said the essence of the entire faith is, is mercy. And I want to show you how that works out. The Quran begins with a single statement, and it's a statement that is repeated at the beginning of every chapter except one. It's a simple statement that says, in the name of God, most gracious, most compassionate. Not only is it the first statement in the Quran, it's also what Muslims will say before they do anything, before they get in the car, before they eat their food, before they take a test. Anything that you do, you begin by invoking the name of God, invoking his grace, and invoking his compassion. Okay? And the Arabic for that is Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim. Um, Amma, can I ask you for a favor? Yeah. Can you, add, um, on the board, just write Rahman and Rahim? Just those two words out. Rahman, R-A-H-M-A-N, and then R-A-H-I-M. Okay. So that is the foundational statement, right? Every Muslim knows this. And then following that is a one paragraph chapter. It's a single paragraph chapter and it's entitled The Opening of Fatiha. Okay? And it has six, seven lines to it. Six. All praise and thanks to Allah the Lord of the worlds, with an S, meaning your present world here, the ethereal world beyond, the world of the unseen, those goblins. Um, the most beneficent, the most merciful, owner of the day of resurrection. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Guide us on the straight path. The path of those on whom, the, I'm sorry, the way of those on whom you've bestowed your grace, not on whom your anger, and uh, not on whom is your anger, nor those who have gone astray. So in these seven statements is the summation of the entire corpus of the Quran. So, you know, um, the way my teacher um, taught me um, and my teacher is Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, for anybody who has read his papers or heard him speak, you know that you um, can have the essence of the Quran in the first half of the second chapter, which is very long. And if you want to distill that down, you need only to have the opening. And if you have to distill that even further, you need only the first sentence. And if you really want to get to the essence and the absolute core of it, in that first statement, it starts with B, which is the Arabic to say with, right? If you want shayb and leven, what does that mean? Or T with no. So B is the S is to say with, right? And to be with God, to be with God in all of his names. So divine mercy is both individual and collective. It's vertical and it's horizontal. Rahman, the first word, Bismillah ar-Rahman. <coughs> we've translated that when I spoke to you about it as the compassionate, right? What did I say exactly? I said gracious. <coughs> Arabic is a phenomenal language, and I, I really hope that you get a chance at some time in your life to study it. It is so deep and so rich. English has something like, um, I think, 13,000 words in it, and Arabic has over 60,000. And each, the way Arabic is structured is you have these three or four letter root words, and the longer the word gets, the more complex its meaning gets. Okay? So, Rahman, to articulate it fully in English, it, it's mercy like a mother has for their child. Right? So it's very specific. You are my child, and we have a particular relationship. Rahim, is like rain. When it falls, it touches everything. So in this, God tells us to call on him by both of these attributes, the specific and the general, at the beginning of everything that we do. This is God's relationship with us in his own words. And then he further tells us, guide us on the straight path. So when it's the night prayer, and it's 11.30 at night, I've done the dishes, 
kids are in bed. I checked in on Summer to make sure she's not partying too hard in the dorm. And I go and I do my night prayer, right? I'm reciting this opener over and over again in my prayer. And I'm saying, guide us on the straight path. I'm not saying guide me. I'm saying guide us. So even in our most private prayers, we recite this as a reminder that we're bound to one another in humanity and that the path to him is not a solitary endeavor in Islam. So the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, talked more about good etiquette to your neighbor than any other subject. <coughs> if you did an analysis of the hadith, you would find hadith means um, narrations. There's compilations of things that he said and things that he did. If you did a, um, a statistical analysis, you would find that he spoke, spoke more about having good etiquette and good character than about anything else. Not about laws and do's and don'ts, but about good etiquette. And in, in a direct narration, he said that if your neighbor goes to bed hungry while you are full, you haven't understood your faith. In other narration, he says, you are not a believer, you are not a full believer, until you want for your brother what you want for yourself. Right? Essence of good, good etiquette and good character. So Muslims around the world are really well known for their hospitality and for their generosity. And the roots of it fall in these opening words. Okay? And the essence of good etiquette is not reserved for fellow Muslims one to another. It's the right of anyone in your community. So traditional Muslim societies define a community as 40 houses before you, 40 houses behind you. That was your community. It wasn't, you know, you lived in this suburb, but you went to that church, and that's your community. It's your immediate surroundings. There's a story of a man named Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Okay? He lived in um, about 118 years um, after the Islamic calendar begins. Okay? So in around the year 726 uh, of the Common Era. And he was an Islamic scholar. He was a pundit. Um, and he lived in a neighborhood where his neighbors were Jewish. And there came a time when his neighbors were moving, and they put their house up for sale. And they were asking twice as much money for the sale of their house as other homes. And so he went over to his neighbor's house, and he said, you're asking so much for your house. Why is that? And they said, well, we're asking, you know, 2,000 dinar. 1,000 dinar are for the house, and the other 1,000 is because they get you as a neighbor. That's the extent of good character, the fact that they felt that their house was worth more because they got to live next to this man who had such great exemplary um, character. So what's the connection between good etiquette and mercy? Right? Because we kind of went from talking about mercy to talking about good etiquette. God's already told us to call on him as a Rahman and a Rahim, universally compassionate and specifically merciful. This is the vertical vector, right? And then he tells us to hold on to each other. He tells us to hold on to each other through this journey and that this is his mercy to us, that we are not expected to go it alone. When we do, when we do try to isolate ourselves and go it alone, that's when trouble happens. And this is the horizontal vector, the mercy that we have for one another, with one another. So in order to be good to your neighbor and overlook all their faults requires us to be merciful. It's an unspoken acknowledgement, really, that, and you all know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Do you guys know how big a mustard seed is? It's a common Muslim reference, but you know, most people don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a small little seed that you guys would know. A sesame seed. Do you guys know what a sesame seed looks like? Teeny tiny? Okay, about half the size of it. If you have a mustard seed's worth of hate towards another person, another group, another, period, it really comes from a mountain-sized weight of ignorance. Ignorance of the ultimate command of mercy. <coughs> Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, when God finished his creation, he wrote over his throne, 
my mercy overcomes my anger. And so he began the world with his mercy. And Islam also teaches that God shows mercy to those who are merciful. Mercy isn't reserved for the powerful over the powerless, right? It is for us to exercise with each other so that there is always humility in God's eyes. But mercy really requires action. It requires um, us to interact with one another. To be merciful requires interaction. Because of our own weaknesses, impatience, ignorance, mercy is necessary to keep us. It's necessary to keep us from judging too quickly, shouting too loudly, and hating very deeply. Mercy is a symbol. It's as simple as a smile. It's an open door. It's the kind of things that sometimes Muslims are accused of not knowing. Not knowing how to smile not knowing how to hold the door open. Inviting for dinner, a conversation over coffee. Basic, polite etiquette that is the right of everyone around you, male and female. And if we cannot show mercy to ourselves, our community, our neighbors, really, let's not fool ourselves by thinking that somehow on a national platform we're going to be globally merciful, because it doesn't happen that way. It happens by what you inculcate in your immediate surroundings. <clears throat> so really, at the end of the day, you are an image of me. I'm an image of my creator. And if I'm indifferent to your needs, I'm really being indifferent to what my creator demands of me. The voice of God is something that's placed in your heart from the very beginning. And you all know this. This is something I, I used to tell my daughter when she was in junior high, right? Because this is when all the hormones kick in. That every single one of you is born with a voice inside your head that tells you right from wrong. You don't need your parents to tell you that. They just remind you. It's there. But the day that you choose to ignore that voice, you strangle it. And if you keep ignoring it, you keep strangling it. And one day, it will fall silent. That inner voice will fall silent if you reject it. So that voice is the voice that God put inside of every single human being. It's the voice of mercy that lets you see the humanity in those around you. It's when this voice is silenced that your humanity is silenced and your mercy is removed from you. So people through history have really understood full well what mercy really means. Cervantes said, Among the attributes of God, although they are all equal, mercy shines with even more brilliance than justice. And Shakespeare wrote, The quality of mercy is not strained. It drops as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It's twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives, and him that takes. So this is the cornerstone of Islam when we get it right. Within our faith communities, we must always be cognizant of the moral ideals of our faith and the reality of our condition. So when people ask my husband, who's a, I say a relationship counselor, you know, we deal with individuals and couples and families and those sorts of things. People will always ask him over you know, dinner parties, what's the number one problem for Muslims? He says the same ones as everybody else. There's no difference. The same general rule can be applied to really all faith communities. Regardless of what our faith teaches and what our tradition passes on, we see people that claim one faith or another committing horrendous large-scale crimes. It happens in every tradition. Okay, that if you're, if you're not in touch with your faith tradition, that this is where problems can seep up through the cracks. Um, Psychology Today, um, this is just from a couple months ago, we had um, a, a string of really um, terrible events that happened, and 
the headline on the, on the magazine was, Terrorists are lonely men, not Al-Qaeda mainstays. That a mass murder has been discovered each of the last three days. And when we examine the men's lives, we are struck by their loneliness and by their yearning for intimacy, which leads some to strike out in bizarre and violent ways. This is psychology today from just a couple months ago. So I would suggest that the privatization of American lives does not exactly lend itself to sharing. Uh, when Anna and I were driving over here, I was looking at everybody, you know, uh, walking, and I don't think there was a single head that wasn't bent, right? I do that too. I mean, to the point where my seven-year-old is like, Mom, you said no phones at the dinner table. So I'm guilty of it too. But what happens as a result of that is an extreme isolation with um, a... Um, with a, with a facade, with a, um, with a false reassurance that you're not alone because you've got all these friends on Facebook, right? So if you remember back to grade school days, you would only share your secrets with your biffle. Everybody had a biffle, a best friend for life. So your best friend was the only one that you let close enough to know your personal information. But what's happened over the last 10, 15 years, really, is that society has become increasingly more isolated. And in fact, America leads the trend in that because we are the technology leaders. We've had this stuff for more than anybody else has. And so we lead in the psychosis that follow with it as well. That people have this false sense of connection through the internet, weekend soccer tournaments, but they're not really having conversation with their neighbors. They're not really connected. In this country, you know, it's we're founded on Christian values. The establishment of America is on Christian values. The construct of our houses, traditional houses, have porches, right? And porches on the front, not in the back, they're on the front. And it was very customary until the TV came, literally, until TV was invented for people after dinner to go sit out on the porch, for people to take a walk, visit their neighbors, and stroll. TV was invented, people got up from the dinner table, moved into the living room, and sat in front of a TV. And there's no need for porches anymore. Nobody builds them on their houses. Nobody uses them if they do. It was also customary to, if you have a neighbor that moves into the neighborhood, you bring them something, a pie, cookies, something. Um, you know, I, I readily admit that I am a tiger mom. I am a Muslim tiger mom, which means I must be hyper vigilant post 9-11 to make sure that my children are dealt with well and justly. We um, moved to our, our house we, um, when my daughter was in third grade, third, fourth grade. We um, were in a townhouse, and we had these neighbors who were really finicky. Um, and uh, they, you know, it's a townhouse, so everything is community property. There's a sidewalk; everybody gets to use it. But every time she would ride her bike out in front of their little patio, they would be like, "Don't come on our sidewalk." So we were very, when we moved from that to our house, we were very vigilant about neighbors and how they would um, behave to us moving into the neighborhood. So the first thing that we did, in the first week that we were there, is we put invitations into their mailboxes. So the three neighbors that are across the way are two neighbors to the side and three neighbors to the back, right? We, we didn't go 40 and above and 40 and above. We just went three and three. And uh, we asked them to, to come over for coffee. And it was a really great sociological experiment because these people had lived across the street from each other for 20 years and had never spoken to each other until they were at our house. And they're like, you live in that blue house, right? Oh, okay, yeah, I've, I've seen your dog. You know, and now they um, will stand on each other's driveways, they'll talk, they'll have conversation, and it, it's really been a great change in our neighborhood because well, we bought the house and then we tore it down and we built another one in the same spot. But the reason we stayed in the same spot is because we developed these relationships with our neighbors that was so loving that I knew that my children were protected. And as a tiger mom, that's my number one goal. So 
we're like, we're just going to redo the house right here, and we're going to stay right where we are. And it was such a great experience for us because um, I told my daughter, she was in junior high at that time, I said, you know, if there's a storm, and this is while our house is under construction, we're staying at my parents' house, if there's a storm and I can't come and get you, just go to Joel and Terry's house. And they knew it, and it was just not not even a, a, a con concern for me about whether or not Joel and Terry would take care of them or not. But that didn't come readily. It came by engagement. It came with hard work. Okay? So, social isolation is a modern plague. And this is something that um, is being researched. Maybe some of you are doing this research, anyone? Anyway. So the best research confirms it. Americans are now perilously isolated. In a recent comprehensive study by scientists at Duke University, researchers have observed a sharp decline in social connectedness over the past 20 years. And I'm not saying it has to do with TV entirely. So remarkably, 25% of Americans have no meaningful social support. Not a single person that they can compile it. So if you watch some old videos of the civil rights movement, you'll see civil rights marches where you'll have large groups of African Americans walking hand in hand with very courageous Caucasian Americans. And these are people who stood in the face of bigotry and oppression because they believed in the equality of all people at a time when it wasn't popular to do so. And they stood on the side of God and all his faith communities. And I, and I pray that they receive a just reward for doing that. If you look at videos of the women's rights movements, oh, there's not that much video of that, is there? Pictures of the women's rights movements. You'll see men standing with them, despite the scrutiny and harassment, because it was not a popular thing to do then. And they stood in the face of people saying, we have the right to treat them differently because they look different. That was the whole thing. Right? And they too were on the winning team and had God as their God. So it starts with God, then our family, and our neighbors, our faith community, and other faith communities. We've all seen the images more, more recently of Egypt, where the Coptic Christian protesters, you guys know what I'm talking about? Where the Coptic Christian protesters stood in defense of the Muslims while they prayed, right? And then in the most recent wave of protests that happened, um, there were a lot of churches that were under uh, a, attack. And the Muslims made a human chain around their uh, churches. This is a self-aware community, a community that really can only gain God's mercy by having shown mercy for one another. So, wow, that's an old fashioned so Alexander Pope, an English poet, said, Teach me to feel another's woe, to hide the fault I see, that the mercy I show to others, that mercy also show to me. So I stand by this poem and I ask God, Al Rahman and Al Rahim the universal and the specifically merciful to open our hearts and minds so that we may see the mercy in his creation in our fellow man, all the children of Adam and Eve, and so that we might be merciful to our families, our neighbors, and the world.